career advice, I thought I'd go back and uh, show this second school 10 year ago uh, uh, group photo. So you might uh, uh, see or recognize a couple of people, even some of the speakers I think were there 10 years ago. So uh, it's a pretty well aging community apparently. So. And uh, I think the interesting thing is if just, you know, look at the people and where they went in the meantime, this is maybe the, the, the uh, career advice part of it. So some of them, some of them left academia and lived happily ever after, hopefully. Uh, many of those, I don't even want to start name dropping here, became really big figures in our in our community, and I'm kind of like the person in between. So, uh, so I'm I don't have any permanent position yet, but I still survived in academia for ten years. So, so this might be a, an interesting uh, you know person to talk to me in in the in the career session in the afternoon if you want to. Uh, I think Scott Gaudi recently taught me uh, called me a. a a science mercenary. So, if you want to learn more about how to become a science mercenary, then uh, talk to me in the um, in the break. And one of the tricks is actually have as many uh, affiliations as possible. That's one survival tip. So, uh, I don't want to go into all the details. So, I'm a fellow at the, at Bern University at the moment. Um, I also started with a couple of friends a little uh, company or, or non-profit called Explainable. And this summer, I'm working for Google Cloud at NASA FDA, which most of my talk is going to be about. So full disclosure, if I'm telling you how awesome the Google Cloud is, there might be a connection to the fact that I'm working for them this summer. Um, so just a quick intro. Unfortunately, this video is not working, but this gives you a nice, uh, uh, you know, repeat of the problem that we're working on. So as we heard in many talks already, we are looking for these tiny actions. We haven't seen it, it's actually the point that I want to make. So we really, if we observe this, so I'm coming from the observational side, we really want to find these tiny little dark dots next to these ginormous uh, um, giant stars. And when we eventually get these observations, then we get some sort of data, spectra, time series, whatever. And then we want to get from this data to some sort of information, knowledge, and eventually even some sort of wisdom. And recently there was there's this big hype about artificial intelligence, machine learning, and uh, maybe some of you have seen this, this this kind of you know Venn diagram before. So there's artificial intelligence, and a subgroup of that is machine learning. Then there's these two big groups like classic algorithm, neural networks, and deep learning. And most of this hype is really about this box of deep learning. This is the stuff that really was just became possible to actually use in practice over the past couple of years when the computing power got to a point where you can actually use these uh, deep networks. And deep in this uh, context means that you have a couple of hidden layers. You build these neural networks, and if you have a couple of deep embedded networks, then that is called um, deep learning. And I'm giving you a quick example um, in, uh, in just two slides. So breaking that up a bit, so this is if you, if you uh, go a little bit more into details into most of these, uh, um, algorithms, and then you can see, um, for example, the principal component analysis is already considered machine learning. In principle, a linear regression, a polynomial regression is machine learning. Uh, Monte Carlo methods are a form of reinforcement learning. So I guess if I ask you now who does machine learning, probably many more people will raise their hands because we are actually kind of doing it already. Not Maybe not necessarily the deep learning part, but most of these other methods are just some, some say, you know, machine learning is just glorified statistics or glorified uh, uh, classical methods. So, so a lot of you are actually doing machine learning without even knowing it. And um, I don't want to go too deep into the details. This is very, I mean, I only have like half an hour. I just want to um, uh, give you a link. So go to playground tensorflow.org. So maybe even if you go, go there now, just or even you can even do it on your phone. Just, you know, put in playground tensorflow.org. And... Uh, then push that little play button in the top. Once you have this, push that button. And now you've trained your first neural network. So that's how easy it is. And this is a really nice page to get like a top level first, you know, really feel how it how it works. If you don't need to know anything about the about the theory, you can also not break it. So you won't break the internet or your computer or anything if you make something wrong. So it's really not and no robots will take over the world if you push the wrong button. So really you can play around with all these buttons and really get a feeling how do these different learning rates work, how can I, if I change my activation functions, what happens, what is regularization, how does it work, all that kind of stuff, how can I feature my input to model that data. So it's really 
Uh, it's a really nice, you know, playground literally to to uh, uh, play around with a neural network just to get, you know, first order, top level idea how these work. Okay, so let's talk about NASA FDL. So NASA FDL is an applied AI research accelerator. It's uh, supposed to bring academia and the private sector together in this public-private partnership and work on challenges in space sciences. And how this usually works, early in the year, NASA has so-called big things, like meetings where people think about what challenges are there in the context of NASA, what data sets exist that we could work on with machine learning and AI. And then we define a couple of challenges. So last year, we defined these challenges in four areas, space resources, exoplanets, space weather, and astrobiology. Um, this year, and I'm going back to uh, Mountain View to SETI uh, on Monday to work on these challenges this year. So it's living with our stars, so heliophysics, uh, then moon for good, so uh, making maps of the moon, disaster prevention, so we look at Earth maps and see how floods might, uh, uh, might evolve, and also astronaut health, keeping, um, keeping our astronauts healthy when they go to space. So these are really very diverse, very, uh, um, very different fields, uh, challenges in, in, uh, in, uh, in the context of NASA that we can use with um, AI and machine learning. And how that usually works, so the basic recipe of FDL is we, um, we take four participants, so um, grad students, early career postdocs, usually two of them are domain experts, so somehow in the field. So in this case, for the astrology team, we had Mike and Molly, who were planetary scientists, and then add two students, grad, grad students, uh, early career folks from the computer and big data science. In this case, Frank and Simone were, were more the computer science uh, people. Then we have a bunch of mentors, you know, you know, you've seen Giada, me, who we all know shown, then our team, uh, Gunes were, was our um, AI mentor, a couple of others too, and then in addition to these mentors and participants, we add this Silicon Valley special source, so we had Google Cloud, NVIDIA really providing us with basically unlimited computing power for, for the summer. And then we just take this recipe, take this mixture, and lock everyone up at the SETI Institute for eight weeks and hope that they solve the challenge. But um, that's not all to it, so it's really it's really designed in this, you know, Silicon Bay, uh, Silicon Valley sprint, hackathon, uh, um, kind of, you know, really uh, structured way. So we start with the prototyping week, or really with the big ideas week, where we really just throw around all ideas that we have in this challenge. And I'm going to show you a couple of challenges. So the challenges were really from super narrow and very defined to super broad, and we had no idea what to do. So really just start with a bunch of ideas, and then this typical, you know, fail quickly, identify the ideas that you can really focus on for the next eight weeks. We had uh, bi-weekly reviews where, you know, the mentors and also experts came and looked at the work of the teams to make sure that they're really on track to their goals. And then in the end, after eight weeks, we also had like two weeks where we really wrote stuff together, um, provided uh, a NASA with tech memos, um, uh, prepared presentations, um, and so on. And it was really tough. So it's a really tough program, but it's also a lot of fun. So we spent time at Google, we spent time at NVIDIA, we even met Frank Drake and photoshopped Drake into the image. So it was a really, really lot of, lots of fun that we had there. And it's a really, it, I, I totally enjoy it. So it's, we spent eight weeks with a bunch of much smarter people to, to solve really big problems. So this is at least why I do this. So if, if you're into that, you really look into FDL and maybe apply uh, next year. And uh, before I come to the exoplanet and astrobiology challenge, I just want to show you another challenge just to get an idea about the breadth and and what other things uh, other groups worked on. So one of the problems last year was, um, can we use AI to um, put localization on the moon? So the basic problem is if you see this, you might have an idea where you are, right? Maybe maybe not so many here in the US, but this is a Matterhorn, so this is Switzerland. If you see this, you're pretty sure, you know, I'm somewhere in Switzerland, I might be in the mud. But if you're on the moon, and you have no idea where you are. If you just drop somewhere on the surface of the moon, there's no GPS, the moon doesn't have a magnetic field that you can use for a compass. So how do you localize on the moon? Especially if you're, let's say, an autonomous rover that's supposed to find helium-3 or whatever, how do you know where you are on the moon? So that was basically the problem for that group. And what they did is, first of all, they, um, they used the Unreal Engine. So maybe some of you who play computer games know the Unreal Engine. They used the Unreal Engine to simulate, you know, 3 million square kilometers of moon surface or something crazy like that. Then they had um, some virtual rovers driving around the moon, producing these 360 surround view images that you can see on the top. And then they reprojected these 360 surround views from the rovers into these reprojected view images that you can see here. 
and then use the neural network to learn if I see that around me, this is what the true orbital view from the satellite is. And that's basically how they did the how they did the localization. So you see, so the rover sees what's around it, and then the neural network says, okay, this is how that same area looks looks from, from the orbital view, and this is how they were able to localize that rover on the surface of the moon. And this was a pretty constrained, pretty well-defined uh, pretty well defined a challenge right from the beginning, similar for the exoplanet challenge. So for the exoplanet challenge last year, um, the task was to increase the efficacy and the yield of exoplanet transit uh, methods, so Kepler and TESS uh, um, platforms with, with deep learning. And the basic problem there is, you know, you get all these um, photometric light curves, we search for transits, we want to find those, and then also make sure that those dips, these reoccurring transits are real planets or maybe false positives. So again, really quick uh, how this works. So for Kepler, you start with the target pixel files, so a little the postage stem with a couple of illuminated pixels that are usually a star, but sometimes a star and a background star or binaries or something like that. Then you extract the time series of this image. You get a really dirty um, first order light curve with all systematics and stuff on it. And then you search for planets, so for these reoccurring dips in these, in these light curves and you do some sort of data validation. Then you get a couple of candidates, you know, these threshold crossing events, how they're called. And then usually a team of humans do vetting on it. So they look, okay, this transit looks like a real transit, this looks like a binary, this looks like an instrumental effect. And then eventually they end up in an exoplanet catalog. And when we got our, our assignment for that challenge, we thought, okay, where where can we use machine learning here? So first of all, we say, okay, let's do everything. Just go from pixel to planet and just feed a neural network with it. But that's probably not the smartest thing. So what we figured out in the end, this is maybe the best place to start at least with machine learning. And this is also one of the lessons for or one of the recommendations for everyone. If you want to use machine learning in your field, identify those bottlenecks. Don't just use it for like the whole data flow, just identify where are the bottlenecks in your, if something's already working 96% well, you don't need machine learning to bring it to 97%. But if you have these bottlenecks, in, in this case, if you have um, lots of hours that grad students and, 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 uh, uh, and civil servants spend just looking at light curves, you know, 10 hours a, a day just to identify planets, that might be the bottleneck where you can use uh, machine learning, at least first order, we should look for those before you go to the bigger problems. So here the basic problem is sometimes you get these false positives, you get eclipsing binaries that get uh, signals that look like transits, but you can see you got this odd even effect because of the secondary eclipse, you get a somewhat smaller transit, deeper transit, which is relatively easy to identify. You get these uh, eclipsing background binaries, uh, which have also more like a V-shaped transit rather than a boxy one for, for planets. And then you can also have um, stellar variability that can mimic transits. And uh, long story short, so I really refer to Megan's and use paper for more details. Long story short, what we added to existing models was uh, to use domain knowledge. So in the case of um, the Kepler and, and test light curves, you see a centroid shift with the background binary, for example. So the centroid of your PSF shifts away from your center of the star where you thought the transit was. And that is a pretty clear smoking gun for background binary. So by feeding that extra channel of knowledge to the, to the, of domain knowledge to the neural network, we were uh, able to really improve on previous methods. And uh, long story short, again, uh, look at these, look at, at these, uh, these papers. We were able to um, increase uh, um, 10 to uh, 15 to 20 percent the uh, recall for these really uh, Earth-sized planets. So this might actually help to get a couple of more of these interesting small planets out of Kepler, out of test in the future. Okay, then let's go to astrobiology. So for astrobiology, we had the challenge number one, understanding what is universally possible for life. And then challenge two, from biohints to confirmed evidence of life. Easy, right? One week we are done and then we can just spend the rest seven weeks in, uh, in, uh, in the Bay Area during holidays. So this was really one of the broadest, broadest de defined challenges we ever had at FDL. So we were really sitting there the first week and had no idea what we should even do. Um, we, we thought of, we had a really a lot of crazy ideas. Like, you know, we looked at, uh, we wanted to label images. This image has life in it. This image doesn't have life in it. And then just have a neural network trained on it. We 
if you look at papers that look at the fractal image, uh, the fractal index of images, which are apparently different if it's live or non-live. We thought about plugging um, and actually tried a bit plugging feedback, like a little bit of exogaia into into atmospheric models. So we really tried a lot of things um, uh, out in the first week. So really, that that's part of the program. You really just let it go the first week and just try all kinds of things and then after a while focus on something and what we focused on was that big problem of astrobiology which is n equals one right so this is astrobiology is anything else but a big data problem so we really just have that one data point and since we don't even know what life is we don't even know if this one is an integer or float so it's really uh, anything else but big data so uh, what we figured out maybe the best for like the first FDL astrobiology challenge would be to provide the community with some sort of a legacy data set to really produce big data, even if it's just simulated data, but produce big data uh, in astrobiology that we then could eventually use for machine learning. So what team number one did, they used the Atmos code, which probably, as I already know, talked to a few of you, a couple of you are already using. So what they did, they basically computed 200,000 atmospheres, um, with that VPL Atmos code, and in order to do that, they used um, this uh, VPL Atmos code that, as I mentioned, many of you know, so they translated it into Python, which might already be interesting for some of you using it um, in that Pi Atmos version. And then the cool thing is the group put it in this Docker framework, so who knows about Docker, so use Docker's container. So it's basically a, um, it's basically a, a virtual machine that you create that just does one job. So you create this Docker, this container, which is a virtual machine that just does atmospheres. And then you can, it's really easy, so this Docker system is really easy if you, or it's really uh, helpful if you have one model, one piece of software that you just want to run a thousand of times. So if you want to create a bunch of simulated data really quickly, use, use the Docker. So and that's what we did with Atmos. We put it in a Docker and then just spawned it to the Google Cloud. At some point, I think we were using a thousand or 1500 um, uh, CPUs at the same time running uh, um, uh, running uh, Atmos models, and that was a cool thing to to work with Google Cloud that they gave us the uh, gave us the permission to you know use all their computers on the east coast on the west coast basically. And uh, and what they also did is so so for those of you who work with Atmos that they know you always need basically a seed. So you have to start from a run model to produce the next model, and you cannot really step far away in in parameter space. So what they built, and this is probably the most interesting for some of you besides the data set itself, is this 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 framework to um, explore the data space with, this, um, with these dockers. So you don't just want to um, produce random parameters. You really, especially for, for, uh, for Atmos, you have to figure out which stepwise and which direction do you go if you spawn thousands of models at the same time. You don't want to model the same thing again. So this is really um, the backbone of the whole thing, this, this uh, software that also controls how you spawn these virtual machines in, in, on, in many instances. Uh, team number two went a step farther and they actually simulated observations of exoplanets. So they used the, uh, the Goddard planetary spectrum generator, also pretty widely used. May maybe some of you already used it to you know, simulate single observations of planets. They, did, uh, they produced three million simulated observations um, with LUVA and you can scale it to, each, each, uh, uh, to, to every telescope you want, but we, we, uh, we tailored it to LUVA. So um, three million observations of rocky planets somewhere in the habitable zone. So from, I'm not really sure what the exact uh, um, the, the, the exact numbers, but from you know 0.5 Earth radii to point uh, to two Earth radii, different temperatures from inner to outer habitable zone, depending on how you define it. So a big data set of observations, various uh, host stars, of course. So a really wide range of observations. So a grid of three million of these observations. And here again, similar things. So we um, so, so the group put PSG in one of these dockers, built a framework around it to really spawn these instances of PSG into the cloud to really parallelize it, run you know thousands of models at the same time without repeating the same parameters again. So again, also more uh, a software engineering challenge than than actual machine learning challenge. And uh, Actually, one of the main reasons why I'm here is to promote that data set. So um, thanks very much to, to, to Julian and then the others from the uh, Exoplanet Archive. So they will be hosting those data sets. So hopefully soon 
in the next you know couple of weeks hopefully we will have these two data sets available on the exoplanet archive so all of you who want to play around you know want to try their compared to their own models want to try their own machine learning code on that so there's going to be these hopefully helpful data sets uh, on the exoplanet archive for you and uh, with the second group we actually went we were able to produce these spectra relatively quickly which left some time to actually do first uh, a kind of machine learning exercise on that data set so what we did there was basically seeing if we can produce this really time consuming computational consuming uh, process of spectral retrieval with uh, machine learning so the basic idea of spectral retrieval you probably all heard about it is you get a spectrum and you want to get to the composition or if possible even back to the fluxes of of the uh, of the planet and our question was can we use deep learning to replace these really uh, computational intensive you know bayesian methods and whatnot and all the details are in these papers by uh, frank uh, adam and, and mike in, in preparation so we use so-called uh, ensembles of bayesian neural networks um don't want to go too much into the details too if you have questions you know I'm, I'm around let's talk about the details too so the basic question was can we replace traditional Bayesian sampling methods with neural networks and the quick answer is yes but there are a couple of caveats so first order it works so we trained a neural network um, basically told it this these are the three million spectra and these were the compositions we, we put in and then you can give, can give the network a spectrum and it tells you what it thinks is what the atmosphere is made of. And you can see here the true versus predicted for methane and water. So it does a pretty good job in predicting, seeing the spectrum, what it's, it's made of. You can also see over there the posterior distributions that we produce from a neural network. So not from MCMC or not from, uh, not from uh, uh, your, your nested sampling or something. So this is really from, uh, from, from a neural network. From one of these Bayesian neural networks and you can see here so the star marks our uh, real value and the cross marks you know the the, uh, the best fit from our posterior so we are not that not yet there so this is really just a prototype to show that it works kind of and uh, what the cool thing is so this is really just like one example of, of water and methane the cool thing is really scalable and this is why we hope that we can make that even better and the prototype works even more and, and more more uh, on, on more applications is because you can scale that really well. So some of you who, who do this, you know, classical MCMCs, you r eventually run into too many parameters to fit and have to, you know, sacrifice one way or the other. So with these Bayesian neural networks, it's much easier to scale up to, you know, in this case, I think it was 15 or 20 parameters that we, um, that we were able to retrieve. So uh, this is still a work in progress. You see, in some cases, we are quite far off uh, of the predicted uh, values of the, of the real values. So this is really still, Still work in progress what we did so was comparing it uh, to other methods so there were a couple of you know of course the traditional um, retrievals there was also exogan hela two other uh, uh, methods that used machine learning for retrieval and what we did was to benchmark especially against the hela um, the hela code um, i don't want to go too much into those details so what we did was comparing to this marcus nela paper where they used random forest I think it was a nature astronomy pretty hype paper about the first use of these to pro produce posteriors what we could show in our paper was that we basically outperform these random forests in every in every uh, metric that that you that you want to use and that we are also much closer to the actual retrieval the, the truly bayesian retrieval methods um for example in the paper from laura kreiberg so this was actually applied on a bike to camera three spectrum of was b so these methods also work for jupiters if you have people working on jupiters um one caveat and this is where it comes to um that that yes but that i mentioned so um these posterior distributions are not truly bayesian so you can show these bayesian networks are in some limits in some extreme they um they become truly bayesian in this log evidence com model comparison sense but those are not truly Bayesian posteriors. And sometimes it's even worse that in this case, for example, the random forest in one standard of our, um, uh, of our validation set, you can see here, this is the real value, this is the fake value. So the model is really confident, but really wrong. So this is uh, uh, any, any similarities to real person is only coincidentally. So, um, so that happens. So this is one of the caveats of machine learning. So you really have to know how to use it um, 
whereas our code at least knows when it does not know. So this is um, maybe this not the best uh, result, but at least we, we can trust our algorithm to not be confident when it doesn't know what to do. So um, so that's kind of like reassuring. And this is also, I think, most, one of the most one of the, the, the uh, misconceptions I always say, yeah, but you don't know really your code over just gives you machine learning just gives you best fit. You don't know how confidence is. So this is really there are ways to get confidence levels out of out of uh, uh, deep networks. That's, that's maybe like the message here. Okay, to come to my conclusions, um, number one, as I hopefully showed you, you're already doing it, and if you press the play button, you already trained the neural network today. Uh, Data is really the driver. So whenever you have a machine learning problem, preparing the data, massaging the data, bringing the data in shape for the machine learning application is usually 80% of the work. Most of these machine learning algorithms are just two liners in PyTorch or, or, or TensorFlow or something like that. Um, as I showed you, machine learning AI is a toolbox. So it's really not just one hammer that you can use for every nail. So it's really a super diverse, a super uh, various tools that you can use for specific problems. And deep learning is just one new tool in this box. So there's probably most of the things you can still use your old MTMC, and it's probably the best to use your old MTMC. Sometimes you know you just need a linear fit. You don't need you know deep neural network to fit to fit a straight line. So um, really, and this is my last uh, advice: is really talk to the experts. So so those people know how to use it. It's don't use machine learning as a black box. That community worked on it for you know tens of years in the AI winter, and now they're just happy that they can finally use it in practice and they're happy if they get domain people to ask them to work on their problems with them. So they're usually really, really nice and really excited to, you know, especially when we come as our uh, pretty interesting topics, they're happy to help. So um, that's, that's definitely my advice. And then I want to close with, um, I make two bets with you. So um, if and not when, this is important. So if we find the first signs of life in space, I make the bet with you that machine learning was used one way or the other. So either the planet that we found life on was used, uh, was found with AI or the on autonomous bot that found the biosignature on on Mars was used machine used machine learning. So that's my bet number one. And then bet number two is that it might also happen in one of these public private partnerships such as FTA. So maybe not just an academic endeavor and uh, maybe that's a good topic to talk about our lunch. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that talk. Uh, so I'm in the exoplanet direct imaging community, and there's a lot of interest in that subfield for applying machine learning to imaging data sets. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem we currently have, though, is such a tiny number of true positives where we know that we have a planet and then we can actually train something on it. Uh, we also have no idea how many true negatives we have. So um, even though there's so much interest in the subfield, I feel like we're really sort of at a bottleneck uh, for using machine learning. So what do you think the next machine learning tools are that would be most useful for direct imaging? Um, and uh, how do we get around our current problem? Yes, so, so there are a couple of really interesting fields. So I also talked to someone about microlensing, where I think there's a huge potential for uh, uh, machine learning and uh, imaging too. So I mean, I'm not sure, so where are you using it for? Are you using it for PSF correction of to replace the whole pipeline or spectral correction or what, what are you using or trying to use it for? Uh, PSF correction, no, but it's, um, uh, the, the problem in direct imaging is the uh, speckle noise. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's where, where you, these tiny, you get these um, basically scattered light from tiny optical imperfections in the system and trying to beat down that noise so as to pull out what's a true PSF mm -hmm. as opposed to just a speckle, which is a reproduction okay. of the star PSF, that's the hard part. Okay. And the problem is you have a really um, imbalanced data set, basically, right? So this is a common problem in, in, in machine learning. So especially if you do anomaly search, for example, you know, if you have, you know, for example, when we, when we did our test data set or the test training data set, you know, you have a, one million light curves, let's say, you have 100 planets and 2,000 2,000 false positives. So the key here is really you have to train the network on a balanced data set. So if, it, if you train it on 
false positives and one real data point, it's 99% right if it always guesses that it's not. So, so this is why data balancing is really important. And there might be some data augmentation tricks so you can augment your data. So maybe you, some of you have seen that with the cat images, you rotate the cat, you flip the cat, you zoom into the cat and zoom out of the cat. Then you can get from one cat images 10 of them. So there might be ways to augment that data. So if you only have a few true known brown truths uh, planets, you might be able to augment that data. So, but I mean, that's a long discussion. We should, we should talk more about that. But there are ways to get, you know, from small data sets to, to bigger ones. Yeah. 